Hello, welcome back to our live coverage of the United Nations Climate Talks. You've just been watching the uh, Q&A session with Pablo Salon, the uh, ambassador for Bolivia to the uh, UN here. Um, I'm delighted to say we've been joined, well, first of all by Zaina, a co-presenter who's uh, been out in the field for the last uh, couple of days, and also by Stuart McGuinness, who is the head of the International Union for uh, Conservation uh, of Nature, if I've got my uh, acronyms uh, the right way around. director of the Environment and Development Group for, of IUCN. Okay. Right, thank you very much. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about the um, progress here and um, also about um, where you think these talks can uh, move forward. Um, specifically, we're uh, going to look at forestry a little bit. But perhaps I should um, ask you to begin by asking uh, what, uh, what your organisation does. Okay, well, IUCN is uh, a union of members. We've got a, over a 1,100 members, and those range from states like Mexico, for example, the United States, uh, Liberia, uh, right through to government agencies. Um, who manage national parks authorities or water authorities, um, forest departments, um, to about 850 NGOs from big famous ones like WWF mm -hmm. to small grassroots organisations working in Ghana or Tanzania. And what joins them all together under IUCN? What's the common thread? Well, conservation of nature, it's in our title, so that's and, and looking to ensure that we actually have a, a world that's a, f a fair world that really values and, and, and conserves biodiversity in nature. And, and why, why is climate change a big issue for you guys? Like we hear a lot about um, the kinds of impacts we're expecting on, on people, um, but, and, and we hear about polar bears as well, but what, what, what other kind of impacts are, are you worried about? Well, there's... The, the, we look at this from two perspectives. One is obviously climate change is an increasing threat to, to biodiversity. And we're already starting to see the impacts of, of climate change on, on systems like coral reefs. That, uh, that, that, that uh, coral reef, that it could be that by 2030, coral reefs worldwide are actually in, in long-term decline. So obviously we're concerned that, 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 that uh, climate change is gonna have a real impact on the species and the ecosystems that we're seeking to conserve. The other side though is that nature's not just threatened, nature also offers a solution. And some, there's some really good options out there if we could mobilize our, our efforts around that, that would give us a quick start to start to deal with both mitigating uh, climate change, that means slowing down the amount of CO2 that's going into the atmosphere, and also helping people to adapt to the impacts of climate change because the impacts are already with us. And is that what brings you to COP16? Yes, exactly. So what, what we're doing is we're, we're promoting a, a couple of, uh, um, of key approaches that we think are really important uh, that the delegates need to, to make sure our, a decision is taken on and, and put in place a framework to allow people to take action on the ground. And what are these approaches? What are you, what are you pushing for here? Well, there's, there's two main approaches that we're pushing for. Number one is a nature, what we call a nature-based solution to slowing down the amount of, of carbon dioxide that goes into the atmosphere. And that is primarily based around forests. You probably know, your viewers probably know, that forests contribute perhaps 17 17 percent, let's say one-fifth of all the CO2 that goes in the atmosphere comes from forest destruction, forest loss, forest degradation. So that's one, that's, that's one option that we could slow down, if we slow down the rate of deforestation and that's, that we could move quite quickly on that, you start to slow down the amount of CO2 that goes into the atmosphere. Equally, trees also sequester carbon, so they pull more carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. So you're getting a double win there. And it's interesting, it's interesting just to note, um, if you look at the first commitment period that, that between 2008 and 2012, when the, when the rich world agreed to some rather modest targets, they probably reduced the amount of carbon, carbon dioxide by around uh, two, uh, 2 billion tonnes, 2 gigatons of CO2. Um, Brazil has been very active over that same time and trying to slow deforestation. And they probably have 
reduce the amount of carbon dioxide going into the atmosphere by a similar amount. So if you look at all the effort that the, uh, the developed world has taken and then you look at the effort of a country like Brazil, you can see the real potential that forests offer. I went to the Brazil Pavilion and saw their exhibition. They're using a lot of satellite data as well to, to help with monitoring deforestation. But what I was going to ask you is how do these aims reflect in the talks you've been having here? So, like, specifically, what do you discuss here? Well, there's, there, there's, two, there's two things that, 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 that I said that we're trying to push. One is actually to get a decision um, that this reduced emissions from deforestation and forest degradation, which is, which we call RED for short, that RED, that there will be a decision on RED that will actually say, yep, the world is going to use RED as a mechanism by which we can start to slow the uh, slow uh, uh, um, CO2 going into the atmosphere. Equally then, what we want to see is under adaptation, which we haven't talked about yet and is just as important, we want to see that a uh, natural systems are used and that the decision is taken to allow natural systems to be used to help people, especially poor people in developing countries, deal with the impacts of climate change. And, and you've mentioned the role of, of uh, forests and, and this block of policies called RED, uh, reducing emissions through deforestation. Um, they, they, as our viewers will, will come to realise over the course of the afternoon, hopefully, this is quite a controversial topic here, isn't it? There's some organisations who think this is going to be um, a, a, you know, a real win as far as the environment's concerned and others who are concerned about um, indigenous rights, uh, pe people within forests um, and, and how they might be affected by the policies. Uh, could, you, could you try and give a, a, a brief overview of how this, how this red policy works because uh, I appreciate that it's almost impossible to make that simple but like what, what, why is there controversy over this? Okay well, uh, well what we're dealing with is we're not just dealing with a stick of carbon treating the, paying someone to keep a tree on their land and they'll uh, um, so that it, keep, it keeps carbon, carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere it's much more complex than that we're dealing with issues that have been really have been persistent problems over 30, 40, 50 years, longer in many cases, uh, factors that drive people to, uh, to cut down forests. Some of those are economic reasons, some of those are reasons, reasons to do with poverty. Um, and so, and the, the other thing with forests are that a lot of poor people rely on forests in fact, many governments don't actually realise how much people rely, actually do rely on forests, but work IUCN has done has shown that typically poor people in developing countries rely on forests maybe 25 to 30 percent of all their income. Now, if governments put in measures to say you're not allowed to use those forests anymore, then that's 30 30 percent of a poor person's income is lost. And so that's one thing that IUCN is pushing very hard on. It's not just good enough to have red. We need to see red with strong social justice, one that respects the rights of local communities, respects the rights of indigenous people, and critically also makes sure that groups with certain groups within uh, those communities, particularly I'd say women, are not uh, uh, badly affected. In fact, hopefully that they really benefit from this. I'll just remind our viewers, if you see me pattering away at the keyboard, this is an interactive show. We're coming to you live from the UN Climate Talks, so you can send in your comments and questions if you have any. Um, Zaina, I think you were nudging me to ask uh, something. Yes. Um, are there any such projects on the ground now, as you described, that um, balance between protecting the environment and protecting the forests and um, in ensuring the livelihoods of people on the ground? There, there are some projects, but they're, they're just starting out. Um, there's, there's a little bit of a longer history of people planting trees to, sequ to, to, to capture carbon. Um, but to try and stop or change land use patterns to, to, to uh, uh, projects that would actually encourage people not to cut down forests, there are some just getting started on the ground, but they're rather, um, I say, rather early days. And with things like, uh, um, like the Amazon, for instance, um, most of the logging done there is illegal. So it's like illegal loggers doing it, kind of, they're kind of like pirates, right? They go in and they log and they're very hard to track down. So how will you get to them to ask them to, 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 to give them the money to ask them to stop uh, chopping down the trees? 
Well, it may, it, it, uh, that's a good question and actually it's quite a complex question. It might sound simple. Um, because illegal logging and illegal activities happen for a whole range of reasons. Some's just sheer criminality. And obviously what you want to see there is you want to see better law enforcement. You want to see a satellite tracking that will very quickly identify where illegal activities are going. You want to see a enforcement uh, in place that will actually come down on that. Other, other so-called illegal activities are because poor people have been disenfranchised from the forest that they rely on. That people have, the governments, and starting way back from from a from a colonial legacy almost, have said this this forest belongs to the state, and therefore the state will decide what happens to it. And whereas people have lived in those forests, looked after those forests, benefited from those forests for a long time, and yet there's no piece of paper, there's no there's no legal arrangement that says they have got. Um, they, they've got rights over those forests. So some uh, so-called illegal activities are actually because um, because people don't have, have rights to forests, because their activities in a way have been criminalised. And so that's what RED needs to do. RED will need to differentiate where there's real criminal activity from where you have had poor people, where poor people have had their rights denied. And they'll need to take different, different approaches to that. You'll need to make sure that we give the poor people are actually given and rights over forests and those rights are recognized and legally enforced. At the same stage then you need to make sure that some of the some of the people who are doing it just to steal wood don't have that opportunity anymore. <laughs> and, and, and how optimistic are you that these kind of safeguards and measures are going to be uh, passed as part of these talks if not here then and later on because uh, and, and, and even if they are talk, uh, passed, how are they going to be? How are they going to be kind of implemented on the ground? Because you have governments that have huge power. You have illegal um, you know, loggers, and some of whom are criminals, who presumably also have quite a lot of power in some circumstances. And then you have indigenous farmers, that the most vulnerable, and, and, and those who are kind of uh, most at risk, and, and they have very little power. So how how on earth does this get kind of implemented on the ground? Um, well, to answer your question, I'm optimistic. Mm -hmm. Whether I'm, I hope, I really do hope that we will um, see a deal on uh, that on forests come out of this um, these negotiations. That's not guaranteed. But there was I, I was at the Forest Day yesterday, where, where pre, pre, uh, President Felipe Calderon, the president of Mexico, made a very impassioned plea for a. For this, this, these negotiations to to finalise a deal on on forests, and I think there's a lot of goodwill, and it's a, it's a, it is a difficult issue, but I think we're slowly moving along there. Um, what we need, all those questions you've asked, there's only one way to, to do that, and that's to get on the ground and to start to implement. We we, but we're not implementing from scratch. We've got 30 or 40 years of experience on trying to do this. We've a lot of ex that experience. There's failure associated. There's also some success. I'll give you one one little example that IUCN has worked with uh, with the, the Ministry of uh, Natural Resources in, in Tanzania for over 20 years on. Northern Tanzania, there's an area called Shinyanga. It was known as as the Desert of Tanzania by 20 25 years ago. Step by step, the, the, the Ministry of Natural Resources, uh, working with various other partners and getting some funds from the Norwegian government, started to implement a, a project. They started initially to, to plant trees, but the local people weren't that keen on planting trees. But then they started to talk to the local people they, and got them on side. And now you have got a large area of, of, of woodlands that have been restored. In fact, half a million hectares of woodlands that have been restored. Not only that, but then on the farmland, people allowed trees to come back. So now you've got an extra one and a half million hectares of farmland, still productive, in fact, even more productive now, that's got, that have more trees on it. And that's got real results for people. People have been able to send their kids to school. They've even been able to build school buildings and to, to from the profits they've made from those forests. Um, and they've also sequestered something like 42 million uh, tonnes of CO2. They didn't intend to do that, but that was another benefit as well. So we've got some really good experience that we can build on and, and good experience on how you can work with communities in a very positive way 
to, uh, to, 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 get a, to, to arrive at a good outcome. I mean, it is a win-win situation for everyone. Um, and um, I, I wanted actually to, to wrap up by, uh, it is time to wrap up, uh, <laughs> uh, by asking you um, about the work of IUCN. So this year was the inter International Year for Biodiversity and next year is uh, forests, right? Forest. So could you tell us a little bit about what's going to be happening if people want to find out more about, are there, you know, what happens when it's the International Year of Forests? Uh, it was interesting you asked because I've just come from a meeting from with with other colleagues from the, the World Bank and FAO and uh, the United Nations Environment Programme. We're actually just discussing this about what we're going to do for the International Year Forest. Now I can't give everything away, of course, <laughs> but I think we. W w but I think I, I think there, we will certainly want to. Well, number one, we've got some very very good targets that have come out of the the, the biodiversity negotiations in Nagoya. And we've got four in particular that relate to forests, slowing down the loss of forests, restoring forests. That's my passion. I'm, uh, and and so we'll be we'll be trying to organise um, a, a process whereby we'll encourage governments and companies and individuals to start to think about how how they can contribute to a target to restore degraded ecosystems, including forests, by 15% by 2020. So we'll be announcing something on that. Uh, we'll be profiling our, our colleagues at the, at the UN have been running a, a film competition and we'll be presenting uh, some films that really show the, the, the role the forest can play in, in people's livelihoods. Uh, we'll be having a couple of big announcements, but I'm going to... You'll have to wait until February to hear those. Well, but since, since you mention uh, films, actually, let's. Uh, we, first of all, we thank you very much for taking the time to come and meet with us. It's, it's been, been it's been a relief to have a conversation about forests that I understand without any acronyms, <laughs> and I'm sure the, I'm sure our viewers feel the same. And um, I joined the members of your press team to a trip to a mangrove forest, um, which involves restoration. It involves working with local people to um, living within this biosphere, balancing their livelihoods with um, sustainable practices and it was a, a wonderful wonderful trip um, and uh, we will leave you with this film right now mm -hmm.